Well, good evening, everybody. Those here and those who are watching us on live stream, I've just had a couple of messages. People are saying, I'm looking for the live stream on Family Matters, so hopefully they have tuned in for a time. So I'm Catherine or Kay Jordan, whichever name you choose to call me, from the Diocese of Cornerbrook and Labrador. And this evening, I'm really happy to welcome my friend, Ann Jameson, to uh, <clears throat> come and speak to us. And her, She's here on vacation with her husband, David, some of you have met on the way in. And I really want to thank you for offering to do this session as a true steward of God's gifts. And I've known Ann for several years now in her role with the Diocese of Hamilton, which is Bishop Crosby's diocese. And most of you know Bishop Crosby. Anne is presently the Executive Director of the Ontario Institute for Catholic Education. And that's an organization that was established by the Assembly of Catholic Bishops of Ontario and represents seven Catholic education organizations in Ontario. And prior to that, she served in numerous roles as teacher, university lecturer, she's a published author, and she was Director of Catechesis for the Diocese of Hamilton. She completed her doctorate in ministry in the area of catechesis through the University of Toronto, and she sits as the Bishop's Delegate on the Board of Governors of St. James University in Waterloo. And in August, Anne was appointed to the Vatican's International Council of Catechesis. She was on the farm, so you can imagine the surprise she got <laughs> when she got a letter from the Vatican saying you were in. And that council consists of four bishops, four priests, two religious women, and eight lay people, four of whom are women, and that represent Europe, Asia, North America, and Australia. And the ends and demands keynote speaker throughout Canada, and we're really glad that she's here with us. If you ask Anne to describe herself, she says she's a wife, mother, author, teacher, and a lifelong learner. So all those other things are just side things along the way. We're going to start with the prayer, the diocesan prayer, which most of you know. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O loving God, you sent your Spirit upon the Holy Church, and it kindled within her the fire of your love. Fill us, we pray, with that same Spirit, so that our faith communities may be enlivened and renewed. May our prayers, lives, and sacrifices inspire within us a new energy to live the joy of the gospel. Deepen our belief that you are with us always, and give us the hope to which we are called. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And by the way, Bishop Barth is joining us via live stream. That's if he can get that app working on his phone. <laughs> he's in the Happy Valley Crusade, and right now he's way to Nakwashish. So that's why he's not with us. Okay, Anne. Thank you very much, Kay, and thank you very much for all of you who've joined us here this evening and for all of you who are joining us online. I was very excited to be invited here to talk on this topic of family matters. And I just want to say, I, I want us to think about that title in two ways. Um, the word matter has a number of meanings. So the first meaning I want us to think about is that families do matter. They matter very deeply. It counts what happens in our families. We know this from a sociological point of view. We know this, how important it is, the lessons we learn in our first family, the strong influences those early experiences have on us. So it's influential, it matters what happens in our families. But I also want us to think about the matter of families, the stuff of our families. And by that I mean all of the stuff we do as families. How do we organize ourselves? How do we know whose job it is to take garbage out, to feed a dog, to uh, clean up after kids. How do we organize ourselves? How do we vacation together? How do we play together? How do we argue? How do we ask forgiveness and forgive one another? 
How do we count our successes and how do we face failure? How do we deal with our grief? How do we love one another? So that's the stuff I want to talk to you about tonight. Now when Kay introduced me, she did say that I am from Ontario, and if I was to make a confession now, I'll tell you that I was actually raised in the big city of Toronto. And I want you to know that in Toronto, we know what the rest of Canada says about us. So it's okay, whatever your uh, opinion might be, about somebody who comes from Ontario in the big city. I now, and for the last 30 years, have lived on my husband's family farm, where we are raising our four children, who are the seventh generation of the family, to live and work on that farm. So I think I have a little of the uh, rural in me now. But I'd like to tell you about what families are like in my experience in Ontario, because I don't want to presume that what your families are like are the same. I suspect we have similarities, though. But I'll tell you about the people that I know. There are no regular, standard, expected families. I don't mean there are no mums and dads who are married with children. There's lots of families like that. I'm sure there's lots of families like that here. I'm saying families today, it seems to me, come to us as very complex realities. And some of the complexities that I see in the families that I know, my own family, in the families that come to the parishes and the diocese, uh, where I used to work, the families who come to our Catholic schools in Ontario, some of the things that make them complex are this. Like employment situations are complex in families. Often two people need to be working in order to make things work. And although we've had many times where things have been good in the economy and difficult in the economy, ups and downs where there have been pressures on those kinds of things. COVID, of course, the pandemic has caused a whole other level of people being at home and people being without work or without enough work or without satisfying work. And we know many businesses suffering now from lack of workers. So there's complexity around employment and it causes pressures around the amount of time people feel they have or the security that they feel that they have. But there's also a lot of complexity around schedules. Where I'm from, you are not doing your parenting job unless your child is involved in two or three organized activities. You know, that's very different from when I grew up. When I was growing up, my brothers and sister and I were just sort of let loose out of the family home, quite honestly. We were allowed to bike where we wanted to bike. We were allowed to have pickup hockey games and pick up baseball games. My family knew all the families who lived around us. There was no real trouble, my mother and father thought. I mean, I think my brothers found some, but none, none too serious. But there was no real trouble for us. Nowadays, those things seem to be very rare. It's more likely that we've registered children for activities, and then they're very scheduled. We have to be there on time for practices, and again, COVID has absolutely interrupted some of those routines, but it affects how we organize ourselves as taxi drivers, as parents and grandparents and older siblings and aunts and uncles. It affects our meal times. When can we organize ourselves to have dinner together? There's complexity for sure around family configurations. Again, we have lots of families that have mums and dads and children all living together, but we also have lots of families who are blended families, where we have some children coming in and out of the home at different times. We have families where not both mum and dad are Catholic, we might have somebody who's practicing the Catholic faith and somebody who comes from another Christian tradition or no tradition at all. We have people who are in single parent families. More and more we have a participation of grandparents in families in ways we never did before. 
again, when I was growing up, and obviously that was a long time ago, but when I was growing up, my grandma's house was somewhere we absolutely went on Sundays. We either went to grandma's house or grandma and grandpa came to our house. There was always a big meal on a Sunday night, and grandma had a very special treat called ginger ale in her refrigerator that my mother never let us have, but grandma had treats. Now more and more we have grandparents who are really participating in the lives of their children in ways they may not have dreamed of when their children were younger. They're supporting their children financially. They're supporting their children in housing. We have so many grandparents who are supporting young families with young children in the faith development of their grandchildren. And if you are a grandparent watching now or a grandparent here, I just want to say a special thank you to you. That's such a gift to the church. It's such a gift to your family. It's such a gift to your grandchildren that you do that for them. We used to joke in the Diocese of Hamilton that in the catechesis office, we needed to add a separate line and say, if you're a concerned grandparent, press two for assistance, because we had so many of those calls. There's also complexity because of technology, and I'm so amazed that we're doing Facebook Live. I'd like to say this is my very first Facebook Live event, so I'm very excited about that. Imagine I came to Newfoundland for my very first Facebook Live. What's interesting about the parents that we meet today and their children is that there is no parent alive today who was born into the technological world that we have. First smartphones came out 2007, 2008. That's really when our technology started changing the ways in which we live, changing fundamentally how we interact in the world. And all of the children alive today are, for the most part, digital natives. So their parents are digital immigrants. Their grandparents may be digital immigrants or digital don't know it. And then the grandchildren, the children, are digital natives. And it's not just that they're plugged into their phones and their devices a lot of the day, although that is true. The way they look at the world is through their phones, through their screens. I'm amazed watching our youngest daughter, who's now almost 17, it's hard to believe. I'm amazed watching her sit to watch television. She always has at least one other screen going. She's always involved in some kind of a, another activity simultaneous to the TV show. I mean, when I was growing up, we didn't even have television converters. You had to watch the whole commercial through. There was no Netflix watching movies without commercials. We waited for what came on on CBC, and you lived through every one of those commercials because there was no other choice. Now they have a much more, some would say distracted, but a much more plugged in. They're constantly looking for input. And it's changing how they understand the world. And that can be a complexity in families. I tell people I am more likely to get one of my children to come down to see me if I text them from the kitchen than if I use my big booming mother voice and call them down. So there's all kinds of complexities going on in families. And, and that's what I notice in Ontario families, maybe some of that resonates for you too. Families have a lot going on, so I don't want you to think that I've come here tonight to tell you about another thing that you need to do. Because the one thing I have found about the families I know, none of them are looking for another job. None of them feel like they have extra time and they're just wondering how they can use it. Most of them feel very busy and very tired. So I want us to think about the things we are already doing, the stuff we already have, the lives we're already living, and think about how we are being more attentive or could be more intentional in how we deal on our family lives. I picked up one of the hymnals tonight and I was flipping through it and somebody asked if I was going to sing and I said, 
absolutely not. Um, I often forget the bucket in which I carry my tune. But I have the CBW3 here. Number 583 is As We Gather at Your Table. It's one of my favorite hymns. As we gather at your table, as we listen to your word, help us know, O oh God, your presence. Let our hearts and minds be stirred. Nourish us with sacred story till we claim it as our own. Teach us through this holy banquet how to make love's victory known. That's a gathering song for the Mass, but we know the home is a domestic church as we gather at our tables, as we listen to your word. Help us know, O oh God, your presence. Help our hearts and minds be stirred. My very favorite line is in the second verse. Turn our worship into witness in the sacrament of life. We are sent out every Sunday from this place to turn what we've done here, our worship, into witness in the sacrament of our lives. I want to talk to you a little bit more about that, the sacrament of our lives. We're going to talk about four simple ideas. We're going to keep it very simple about our lives. I'm going to talk about objects, ritual, time, and language. Objects, ritual, time, and language. Four things that the church has lots of. Four things we could talk about how the church does those things. But we're going to talk about how families can do those things. How parents, how grandparents, and how parish catechists who help lead parents and grandparents and children and whole families can think about objects, ritual, time, and language as a way of helping people turn what we do here at church, our worship, into a witness so that our lives become sacramental. I was an elementary school teacher for many years. I was a French teacher, Madame Jameson. And, you know, we call, when we do extended French, we call it French immersion. We want to immerse the children. So we're really trying to soak them in it, right? That's what we're trying to do. And in Ontario, we don't have lots of, especially the area I'm from. I taught for many years uh, in schools in the south end of Cambridge, Ontario. And I'd just like to give a shout out um, to all the Newfoundlanders who uh, now reside in Cambridge, Ontario, because there's really only two kinds of people that I taught in the schools in Cambridge, both of them good, good folks from islands. You were either from Newfoundland or you were from the Azores in Portugal. It was the great uh, cultural divide in Cambridge. But those children went home to non-French speaking houses. You know, in Ottawa it might be different. You might have some French around you that might benefit outside of the school, not in the region I came from. So what I was providing them in the classroom was all they were going to get. So we tried to think, how could we soak them in the French? Well, you know, I thought I was a good teacher doing good lessons, but I wanted to have lots of little storybooks around, French storybooks, so that a child could choose to read something or even look at some French words from time to time. We put up French posters and we labeled things around the classroom in French, so they started to get some language. Le pupitre, la fenêtre, la porte, le tableau noir, when our classrooms still had blackboards. As I say, I'm quite a bit older. We don't use blackboards. Everybody's got a smart board now in their classrooms. But we tried to take them on cultural exchanges, you know, take them to historical sites or cultural centers we taught them French songs. We ate French food. We were trying to give them some sense of what it was like to be soaked in the language and the culture. We wanted to soak them in it, provide some structure that would strengthen that fledgling interest, that desire to know more, and also give them, of course, good content, feed them good content. And I'll say a little bit more about soaking them in it, strengthening them through structure, and giving them content, feeding them at the very end. But let's think about these four areas I talked about. Objects, ritual, time, and language. 
So I want you to think about the objects in your home, and I'm so grateful to those of you who are joining us through the Facebook Live, because perhaps you're in your home, so it's not even an imagining for you. You can just look around the room you're in. I want you to think about all the Catholic stuff you might have in your house. Start making a little mental list of what you think you have. You know, a lot of people don't think they have very much. You say, well, do you have a crucifix or a cross on your wall anywhere? If you haven't got one on your wall, have you got a little one that sits on a mantle anywhere? If you haven't got one like that, have you got a little gold chain that has a little gold cross or a crucifix on it? I bet you've got something like that. I'm very certain you have a rosary of some kind. You probably have a Bible, and maybe you even have more than one Bible, which would be wonderful. So those are sort of the big things, but what else have you got? Have you got a little saint's medal anywhere? Maybe it was something from an aunt or a grandma or your mother. Do you have anything like a little plaque that has um, a saying on it, um, a little prayer, something from the Psalms maybe? Do you have anything like a photograph? I tell you, young people today really enjoy photographs. They come from a very picture-rich culture. They're constantly snapping pictures on their phones, constantly posting them, but they're up and they're gone as fast as they're there. They're digital. A, a real photo that we used to have printed on paper, that's quite a thing for them. Have you got any photographs, especially of you or your, your children or your parents when you made your sacrament? I have a wonderful picture, and here you'll know I was a child of the 70s, and my hair is long with the big flip at the bottom and a nice big white headband with flowers. I've got a little white dress on that comes above my knee and knee socks that come up right to my knee and not all my teeth shining a big smile on my first communion. My children think that picture is hilarious. They love it. What Catholic stuff do you have? And where is it in your home? Is it in a box somewhere, kind of at the back of a shelf, or where have you stored it? One thing that happened to me during the pandemic that I thought was an incredibly positive thing, and there were many pieces of the pandemic, we're still living through it, but many pieces that were difficult. But I'll tell you, when we shut down our churches for Easter, it was so painful. Thought I could miss Mass like that. I never thought I could miss the Eucharist like that. It was very hard to be away. So we set up the couch, we put three chairs behind. I have four children, they're all grown, so we're big people now. We need the couch and three chairs to fit us all. We can't squish on the couch. We turned the TV on. Like it didn't feel like Easter, it didn't feel enough. So then I looked at my coffee table and I thought, well, now I've got, a, I've got a candle at home that has a little cross on it. Let's get that. And it's white. That's Easter. I've got a crucifix up in my room. I got that and propped it up. I got a Bible, opened it to the reading we were going to read that day. And I asked one of my children to light the candle with a match before we began. It's really the first time. This is 2020. It's really the first time I ever really felt like we were a domestic church. I really felt it in that moment. I thought, this is what it is. I'm trying to make church in my living room when this is all the church we can have. I want to encourage you as parents and grandparents, but also as catechists, the stuff of our Catholic tradition is interesting. It tells stories. It speaks to long-standing faith, old wrist rosaries, beads that are, are made worn from the constant rubbing. They tell stories about the generations before us and our faith, stories that maybe we haven't felt confident to share. The stories of our sacraments, our children's sacraments. Bring those objects out from the shelves. Dust them off a little bit. Find a spot for them and ask yourself, what's the right spot in my home? You think about how children delight in a nativity set. 
I always say, I hope we put out our nativity sets as early as we can and leave them as long as we can. Children love to move those figurines around. Even if it's small, even if it's plastic, even if it's just the Mary and Joseph and Jesus, the Holy Family, they enjoy and they learn and they interact with. I'm encouraging you to find your other Catholic stuff. When you put the nativity set away, get something else out. If I was a catechist in a parish, I would be asking my parish priest if I could show the children a mystery object, whether I was online with them or live with them. I'd get out the thurible. How often do children see a thurible up close, right? Only if you're the altar server do you really ever get to see it up close. It's such a remarkable device that the top half comes off and up the chain so that you can put the incense down. I don't want children to play with sacred objects, but I do want them to explore them. I want them to wonder, what is it? We have wonderful words like thurible that we could teach a child. We could soak them in some language and some objects of our tradition. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing to come to Grandma's house and know that when I come to Grandma's house, she has four rosaries and she's got them out. And I can look at them and touch them and think about the ones she loves best and where she got them from. And Grandma can teach me the Hail Mary. Think about the stuff, the objects, because it's an important way to soak them in it. Now rituals, families have all kinds of rituals. And sometimes when you say ritual, people think it has to be something fancy. Ritual just means the way we do something the ongoing way we have of doing something. So I want you to think of a very basic ritual in your family right now, and I'm gonna ask you to think, what is the way that you celebrate birthdays in your family? So for some families, it's a very big deal, birthdays. And somebody always bakes the cake, and, and we always have a party with people from school or people from the neighborhood. Sometimes birthdays are something that we always get the ice cream cake. That's what we always do. Sometimes we're allowed to have the number of guests for how old we are. I never knew that trick when I was a younger mother, and I'm very sad about that. We just had whoever, but that's all right. I'll know when my kids are grown and they're ready to have their own kids, I'll tell them the one guest per year of age trick. My mother and father had four rituals that I'd just like to tell you about four Catholic rituals that sort of punctuated my life. Now, we had others, but these four were very simple. Again, I grew up in a time when my mother saw me out the door every day for school, and that's not always the case anymore. But I was guaranteed my mother would see me out the door for school, and every day as I left, she said, God love you. Every day of my life, my mother sent me outside saying, God love you. Now there has to be a moment in all of those years when that reality starts to sink in. When you think, my goodness, I think God does love me. I mean, I knew how profound a statement it was because when I was a teenager and very defiant and oppositional when I wanted to be, there were days I turned back over my shoulder and said very harshly, I'm not sure he does. Because I knew it would really hurt her. She never stopped saying, God love you, sweetheart. God love you. God love you. What an incredible ritual that soaks me in knowing who I am and whose I am. We also, luckily, had seven people in my family, five kids, mom and dad, and so there was one person for each day of the week. So one of the rituals in my family was that we had a day of the week that was our responsibility to lead the family in prayer. So no matter how old you were, what prayers you knew, you were responsible for the grace before meals for one day of the week. Now maybe that's some, a little ritual that you could think about. It made me feel like 
I could lead prayer, my sister could lead prayer, my brothers could lead prayer, my father could lead prayer. There was no person in my family who was not able. Nobody too young, nobody who'd gotten in too much trouble that day, nobody who'd failed a test, who wasn't also able to pray before our meal. It was an important ritual in our house. We also had a ritual of praying three Hail Marys and one Our Father on every car trip we ever took. And that was if we were just driving out to the country to get a pumpkin for Halloween, or the summer we drove all the way to Quebec. Again, my children love the story of the summer we drove all the way to Quebec. I was in grade two, and I very carefully printed the story for my teacher. We're going to Quebec, spelled C-O-B-E-C in the car, and they might have color TV at the hotel. <laughs> this is the little story my children know that says that I was born, not just in the last century, but probably two centuries ago, that we were excited that they might have color TV in the hotel. But no matter where we were going as a family, we always said three Hail Marys and one Our Father in the car. It was a ritual that we had. I'll tell you another ritual. And this is the last of the four I'll share with you. And I'll tell you a little story that goes with this. Um, we were in Disney with our children. We only had three kids at the time. We didn't have a lot of money to go to Disney. You know, you mortgage the house to get one day at the Magic Kingdom. But we went and then the rest of the days of the week, we mostly had them swim at the hotel pool and they didn't know the difference. They thought that was great. But we took them to an area outside of Disney that they used to call downtown Disney. Now they call it, I think, Sarasota Springs. But it's like a mall area. There's a huge Lego store there. And they let the children play with all kinds of Lego blocks for free. So that was a really good activity with the three children. They also have a big splash pad. And again, you don't pay to get in. So it's a really good place to go. So we'd had this big day down at the mall area and the kids had been running back and forth through the uh, sprinkler, the, the spray pad. They had had a big whale of a time, but they were soaking wet. And we had to get back in the rental van and go back to the hotel. And God bless my husband, it had been a long day. He said, sweetheart, you rest. Um, I might have been nursing the youngest one actually. He said, you rest, I'll take the kids into the family bathroom and we'll put on their dry clothes so we can get into the car. That's lovely. I'm sitting on the bench thinking what a lovely day we've just had, and an ambulance went by. And without thinking, I did this. Now my mother taught me that when an ambulance goes by, or if you hear a police siren or a firefighter siren, you make the sign of the cross because somebody's in distress. Because we're asking in that instant for there to be a quick response a good outcome, a courageous saving, if that's what needs to happen. Well, there was a man on the other side of the splash area at downtown Disney who witnessed me do this silently and did this. <gasps> and I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? I do not want to get in a big, long conversation. I have kids in the bathroom. We need to get going back to the hotel. And I don't know what this person's intent is. I have to tell you, at that moment, as he was striding across to me, I was thinking, where is the husband now? And I was so afraid of what he might say to me. You know, I, I didn't think I could defend the whole of the Catholic Church sitting there at the end of the day at Disney. I wasn't sure what he was going to go on about. I mean, I really thought there might be a little bit of a sort of verbal attack coming of some kind. Nothing of the sort. He said, what, what, what did you just, did you just make the sign of the cross? I said, I, I did. He said, was that because of the ambulance? I said, well, yes, actually, my mother taught me that we were supposed to, she, I know, he said, my mom taught me too, and I've never seen anyone else do that. It's a good little ritual. My children all do it. Now, they make fun of me, but they also do it. Rituals have a way of seeping into us. They have a way of habituating us to a way of life. 
The church has important rituals, but families have rituals. We already have them. We already have a way that we say goodbye to one another as we leave the house. We have a way that we welcome each other as we come back in. We have a way that we set the table. We have a way that we celebrate birthdays. I really want to encourage you to think about how you can bring rituals into your practice to help strengthen your children, have an experience of Catholic stuff. If you're a grandparent, I really encourage you to make sure that you sign off every card. I remember grandmother and grandfather sitting with me one day and saying, you know, I don't want to impose. My daughter, she, she's not so, so big on the church right now. And she's upset. I can't take them to Mass. I sort of kidnapped them one Sunday and took them to Mass. And she's all upset. She doesn't want me to take them to church anymore. So don't want to impose. I don't want you to impose. I don't want you to baptize your grandchildren in the bathtub. Please don't do it. I don't want you to kidnap them to Mass, but I do want you to sign every birthday card to say, Grandpa and I are praying for you, sweetheart. You're always in our prayers. And I'll tell you, it's very important in little people's birthday cards. It's much more important in our university students' cards. It's much more important for that 16, 17, 18, 19, 20-year-old who thinks they're so grown up to know that nothing takes them outside of the love of their family and the care of Almighty God. No matter how far away they travel, no matter where they go in life, no matter where their ambition hopes to take them, no matter how smart they get about things, they'll never be too big to be outside of the love of their family and the love of God. Pope Francis often talks about us going out to the peripheries, and he means that in all kinds of ways, but he talks about the periphery where children do not know to make the sign of the cross. Think about what a ritual action that is for us. It's another piece that I'm missing at church. I mean, we're all sanitizing as we're coming in the door, and that's an important show of our care for the common good of one another. But it's not as good as dipping your finger in the holy water font and making the sign of the cross and remembering I was baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I'm looking forward to the day when our holy water ponds flow with water again. Don't miss out on the opportunity, whether you're a catechist, whether you're a grandparent or a parent, don't miss out on the opportunity to take a moment at the door of the church, to pause, to say there's something that we're leaving behind as we cross over this threshold. We walk out of the world and into this place of worship and we remember who we are and whose we are and how we got here. Take that moment with the ritual. So we've done objects and ritual. We're going to do time and language. The liturgical year, starting in Advent, going all the way around. Listen, I tell people all the time, our calendars in our kitchens... You know the ones we have next to our telephone? My saintly husband tells me that if we would just put every activity on the calendar, we would one day be organized. I'm not very good at recording all the things on the calendar, and we are not yet fully organized. He's probably right if I was better at it. But what happens with our kitchen calendar is that it's sort of the 15th of September, and I'm realizing August is still showing. And so you whip up the next page and you realize you've missed three things already. But that's how our time and families work. We go by the yearly calendars and they're squares and they're rectangles. They have hard edges. They end. And we fall off one month and go to the next and go to the next and go to the next. That's not how time works in the church. In our liturgical year, it's always shown in a circle. And I always say it's actually supposed to be a circle like this. A circle that goes deeper and deeper. We get a Lent every year, and you're supposed to know something more about Lent every year. Enter deeper and deeper into that mystery. 
the whole of salvation history lived in a single year and every year I get closer and closer and closer to understanding the truth of it I'm really going to tell you you know we say Jesus is the reason for the season at Christmas Jesus is the reason for every season it doesn't matter the season and I'll tell you a little way I tell teachers and young school children to remember the liturgical calendar I tell them we start in Advent and it's a purple season I tell children purple means we wait 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 we have to be patient what are we waiting for we're waiting for an alleluia season the rest of the world thinks Christmas is a day it's not a day we get a season of alleluia when Jesus is born that we get many days to celebrate that the gold and white days of celebration we wait and then we celebrate then we go into ordinary time kids always think ordinary is boring I say it's not boring ordinary means we're counting we're counting the great deeds of Jesus and again we come into another waiting time not the same as the waiting time in Advent though because when we look at the calendar there's those three red days I swear to you that every time I have done a presentation to grade one to three children there's one little boy somewhere who knows why it's red <gasps> he says it's red for the blood of Jesus like we say yes it is you are exactly right and it changes the way we wait because we have to go through the three sad days. Imagine how sad. Imagine how sad his friends were. They did not know. They did not know what we know, that the big Alleluia season is coming. But you're right, we wait differently because of the three sad days. And then we come again into the ordinary time, not ordinary boring, ordinary counting the great deeds of Jesus. And we know on those great circular liturgical calendars the year is kind of sweeping upwards and we're sweeping upwards towards the end of the year we're in that time now the last sweep up where we're going to get to the end of ordinary time and we're going to hear about the son of man coming on the clouds we're going to have the feast of christ the king king of the universe king of my heart king of my salvation and then the very next sunday we're going to start to wait for the little baby Jesus to be born in Bethlehem again. Help our children, no matter who you are, help them to know that every season has a reason. That there are times when we are waiting, there's joyful times, there's sorrowful times. If you're going to gather some Catholic stuff in your family, Maybe you could find a little bit of green cloth and a little bit of purple cloth. I mean, you could get fancy with red cloth and maybe you want some white too for other sins. But if you just had green and purple, it wouldn't be bad. And make sure that the stuff you put out, you put it on a cloth. So they start to see, invite them, no matter who you are in a child's life, invite them to be a church detective. Have them look around. I'm looking around this church. My goodness. I see some green banners. What does it tell me? And then, if we were having a celebration here, I would see Father in his green robes. What does it tell me? It's a season of growing. That's right, we're growing and knowing the great deeds of Jesus. I always encourage young children to be church detectives. There's lots going on at church. Encourage them to pay attention to it so that they become more attuned to the time to the time of year. The liturgical seasons are a gift to us. I was commenting over dinner with Kay that I was surprised how green it is here. I thought there might be more fall colors already. We're having a little more fall color at home already. My husband said the silver maples at home are starting to turn that beautiful red. Every season is a gift to us. And we know what the seasons are. We, we know when it's time to eat asparagus and strawberry. And we know just by going to the grocery store when it's not. Because if you want asparagus in January, it's a 10 or $12 investment, not the $1.99 you can find it when it's in season. 
We've lost our sense of season in many ways because our seasons are dictated by the shopping malls that start every season the day after the last season. So the minute we're done with back to school, we're into Halloween. I haven't even had an opportunity to sort of soak in September and I'm supposed to be ready for the end of October. And you know darn well the very minute Halloween comes out of those stores, it's going to be Christmas. That kind of pace isn't healthy for us. And it doesn't help us knowing what we're supposed to know about time. The church gives us seasons. Let's think about what the reason is for those seasons and help our young people. We've thought about objects, ritual, time, and the fourth one is language. The church has some very beautiful language. The language of prayer, the language of our hymns, the language of the Word of God. If we have dusty Bibles at home, I am begging you to dust them off. Put them out. Open them up. Point to them once in a while. I encourage leaders in Catholic education, I would encourage anyone who has an influential role in the life of a child, find yourself five good spots in the Bible that really mean something to you and learn that scripture. Take a verse and know it. Romans 8, 38, 39, for I am convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God. I love that one. Jeremiah, I forget the chapter and verse. I'm not good. It might be 29, 11. Uh, we'll have to check that out after. My son says we should wonder nothing, Google everything. But I think it's Jeremiah 29, 11, for I have plans to prosper you and not bring you harm. I am convinced that nothing is impossible with God, right? Nothing shall be impossible with God. That's in the first chapter of Luke. Find yourself some go-to Bible verses. And then immerse your children, whether they're your children in a classroom setting or your children in your home. One of my very favorite things is to suggest that people take a page of address labels. It doesn't cost very much. 33, 30 address labels on a page. Find one Bible verse you really like. Type it into the box. It populates the whole page. Print out your address labels. Now get yourself a little pad of sticky notes and put one label on each note. If you're a catechist in a parish, Send a sticky note home at the end of a lesson so that you have a little piece of scripture that relates to your lesson and tell them, where do you go most often? Think about the ritual of your families. Is the fridge door a very popular place in your house? It's always a popular place in my house when I don't want it to be. When I think the kitchen's all cleaned up and the meal has been had, that's when they wander into the kitchen to open up the fridge door. Or maybe the bathroom mirror, so that every time we're brushing our teeth, we see it there. If you have older children, just put the chapter in verse. Tell them to use their phone to Google it. What is John 3.16? Why does everybody at the football game have that on their sign? Make it a game. Make it, make it exciting for them to find out. But also tell them... These are the words that save us. On hard days, for centuries, for millennia, people have gone on to these words to find the meaning of life, to find the author of life in those words. It's so important that we bring the word of God to our children. And it doesn't have to be a whole passage and a sermon. We come to church for the homily. We come to be fed here at both tables, the table of the Eucharist and the table of the Word. God bless our pastors who are gifted with that gift of ministry to break open the Word in that way, but it doesn't mean that we have no part in the Word. The Word feeds us too and can feed us in our homes and in our families and in our classrooms. I told you at the beginning that as a French teacher, when we were trying to immerse children, we were trying to soak them in it. We were trying to strengthen them with structures that would keep them engaged. And we were trying to feed them with good content. 
turn our worship into witness in the sacrament of life. When we soak our children in the word of God, in the rituals of the church, in the family rituals we have, in the Catholic objects we have, in the prayer we have, soaking them in it is a baptismal idea. We bring our children to be baptized, to be soaked in it, to be immersed in it, literally to be plunged into the death of Jesus Christ and raised to new life again. And we only celebrate baptism once in our lifetime, but that baptismal ritual of being soaked in it, immersed in it, can be an everyday ritual in our family lives. Confirmation strengthens us. We're anointed with the oil. The gifts of the Holy Spirit sealed with those gifts. It's how we're strengthened to be witnesses to the faith for a lifetime. Use your gifts. If you were confirmed, the beautiful thing about it is you don't have to be afraid that you didn't get the gifts. I wasn't sure about my celebration, Messiah. Uh, you know, and I haven't been so, I, I'm not sure. No, no, it was guaranteed to you. You did receive them. And again, if you put those gifts of the Holy Spirit somewhere, set them down, and they got a little dusty because you didn't open them up right away, or you haven't opened them for a long time, it's okay, they're still there. There's still wisdom and understanding and knowledge and courage and right judgment and piety and reverence. Those gifts are still there. Open them up, take a look at them again, and let that strengthen you as the adult and the important influence in a child's life, in a young person's life. And feed them. Feed them on your joy. I heard you pray that the joy of the gospel would be evident. Let them see your joy. It's filling to them. It's tasty to see somebody who has joy in their faith. The last sacrament I'm going to mention as we close our time tonight is the Sacrament of Reconciliation. If we turn our worship into witness in the sacrament of our lives as families, if we are the domestic church, we're going to need to know all about the Sacrament of Reconciliation. I saw a billboard once that said, successful marriages are the union of two radical forgivers. Successful marriages are the union of two radical forgivers. I thought that was so interesting, and it makes me think all the time how grateful I am that I married a good forgiver. How many times have people disappointed us? We won't do a show of hands, and it's a good thing that we can't hear the voices on the Facebook Live, but has your parish ever disappointed you? Has your church ever disappointed you? Have your children ever disappointed you? Has your spouse ever disappointed you? I'd just like to say, I don't think you're living a real family life if your answer is no, it's just all unicorns and jelly beans where I'm from, Anne. All of us experience disappointment and hurts. Reconciliation, forgiving one another, is the key. We're just recently out of the year of mercy. It's not that long ago that we lived through the year of mercy, and in his letter that opened the year of mercy, Pope Francis told us that we had to contemplate the mystery of mercy forever because our salvation depends on it. Our salvation depends on God's mercy. And in the year of mercy, Bishop Conley in the Diocese of Lincoln in the United States wrote a remarkable article called The Reckless Mystery of Mercy, and I'd like to share with you some of his words. Mercy may seem reckless to us at times. Mercy trusts those who have proven themselves untrustworthy, those who have failed us. Mercy loves those who acted without love. Mercy hopes in those for whom it seems all hope is lost. Mercy seems reckless, it seems counterintuitive, but God is merciful. God trusts us, even 
even when we have failed him. God hopes in us even when we have disappointed him. God loves us with love beyond measure even when we do not believe that we are worthy of his love. God is not merciful because he is reckless. God is merciful because we are his children. As I speak to you about family matters, let me remind you, as we become adults, sometimes we think that we're the ones in charge and we have lots of influence, we have lots of agency, we have lots of authority in our own circles. But we will never grow so old and so wise that we are not still the children of God. God is the parent who loves us. That's the family we first belong to. It's the best family we belong to. It's the family where you and I together are brothers and sisters. And we have a brother in Jesus Christ. It's so important what happens in our families. I want you to be connected to your first family. Before you were born, I formed you in the womb. I formed you in your mother's womb. Those words to Jeremiah are words to us today. That's the first family we ever belonged to. There was the family that we were born into, brought up in. Maybe the families we have today created. And in those families, we can do remarkable things to pass on the faith. I've given you some practical ideas about objects, rituals, time, and language, but it's about soaking them in it, strengthening them through ritual, and feeding them with good content, and remembering always that we're meant to forgive one another. We're meant to be merciful just as the Father is merciful, because first of all, he's been merciful to us. I am so blessed to be here in Newfoundland. I am so grateful for your invitation. I'm grateful for your time. Whether you're a parent or a grandparent or a parish catechist, or maybe you wear all three of those hats. God bless you. May God continue to bless your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We just had a come here. We've had people on Facebook wondering if they can get the recording of this and so on. But we just had a message from Bishop Barb to say thanks to Anne. So he did manage to get on his Facebook. Good for you, Bishop. Well done. <laughs> and then this is a little gift from us for you for your time. And we are so grateful that you are here with us. And I see that expression, so let's change it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and the rituals, I, I just want to share one ritual with you that uh, I have used. In the Born of the Spirit series, in, at the end of each lesson, was either the parent blesses the child, and you say, go in whatever phrase, but we adopted, go in peace and remember God loves you, and so do I. My 16 year old grandson came to visit, and uh, his son's birthday was on the wrong time. So I did that with him. And uh, so I would text him, as we do these days, <laughs> and I would just put, remember, dot, 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 and put a plus sign. And one day he said, what is this plus sign that you put in? <laughs> so I reminded him of our conversation. And so now he's 22, and I still text him, I say, remember, dot, 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 and put the sign of the cross. And sometimes, just sometimes, he sends it back to me. So the rituals work. They really do. So thank you, Anne, so much. And uh, we've had comments that so interesting. And thank you for being with us. And we really do. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. And thanks to your kind, patient husband as well. Okay, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. thank you so much. So I'll close off Facebook. I don't know if anybody has any questions or anything for us. That's the best studio audience I've ever had. <laughs> I'm really grateful.